This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. In this episode, I will cover part two of the Dave Kunst Around the World on Foot story that happened in 1970 to 1974. Wow. Stay with the story to the surprising finish. I like surprises. Well, this surprise ending will be a little bit disturbing. Now to the conclusion of the Dave Kunst story. Dave Kunst, originally from Minnesota, now from California, claims that he is, quote, the first person verified to have completed circling the entire landmass of the Earth on foot. In 1970, Dave Kunst started his walk around the world with his brother John. Episode 44 covered their travels from Minnesota to New York by plane to Portugal and then on foot with a mule to Afghanistan where John was shot and killed by bandits. Dave was wounded and returned to Minnesota to recover in November 1972. Dave felt strongly that the walk should be continued and he deeply wanted to get back on the road to experience an exciting and free life without family, job, or financial obligations. He said, the walk will definitely go on. I want to keep the ball rolling. I want to be back to finish what my brother and I started so he will not have died for nothing. After only three months since he had been shot in the chest, in January 1973, Dave Kunst announced that he would resume his walk with his brother Pete. They would travel back to Afghanistan and resume the walk from the mountain pass where John was killed. Pete said, It's too important to all of us to abandon this idea now. My wife understands this, especially since John gave his life for it. We have to finish the job. Dave's wife, Jan, was not as sure. She had mixed emotions about him again leaving her alone to raise their young children. She said, quote, I knew he really wanted to do it. I told him if he had to go, to go and get it over with before the kids are teenagers. I'm scared for him to go back there, but it doesn't seem to bother him. His reply to her worries appeared to be rather harsh. Well, that's a typical reaction of a lot of people. That's really the difference in individuals. Definitely she's right, but if I sat here and thought about that, I'd be miserable here. Dave's brother, Pete Kunst, 28, of Santa Ana, California, was a former Marine who served in the Vietnam War. He was married with four children. Dave and Pete departed from Minneapolis by plane to resume the walk. The two restarted the walk on March 26, 1973, from the exact location where John had lost his life, along with the mule Willie Make It To and the cart that waited for them in Cabal. Eight Afghan policemen with two motorcycles and two jeeps provided protection for the Kunst brothers until they reached the Pakistani border. In Pakistan, they were accompanied by armed tribal guards and a prince up and over Khyber Pass. At Lahore, Pakistan, it was very hot when they arrived. The tourist bureau kindly greeted the brothers when they entered the city with about a dozen cokes in a bucket of ice and water for their mule. They stayed at the American Embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan for about a month trying to get permission to walk across China. By the end of April they were invited to the Chinese Embassy where they were officially denied permission to walk across China. They soon made the decision to stop walking through southeastern Asia altogether after India and go to Australia. They crossed the border into India and visited the sacred golden temple in Amritsar. In June 1973, after another 300 miles, they reached New Delhi. They stopped in New Delhi for a couple weeks. Dave and Pete knew that the next 900 miles to Calcutta would be dangerous through very populated country with many gangs and bandits. About India, Dave said, It is the most unpleasant country we've seen. People drove us crazy, the monsoons soaked us, and India's governmental bureaucracy burdened us. Pete got sick from the food and our mule developed sores from poor diet and the hot, damp climate. Because of Pete's sickness, he did not walk much of the way to Calcutta. 
He hitched rides to leapfrog ahead of Dave. It makes you wonder if Dave also used this approach during times when he was ill. Since there was no true verification taking place by witnesses, we will never know. Dave and Pete arrived in Calcutta. Dave's plan to walk as straight as possible across the world came to an end, but using Australia as an alternative seemed to make sense and is allowed in modern day recognized walks around the world. After more than a month's delay because of custom problems and a dock strike, they bid goodbye to their faithful mule, Willie Make It Too, who they could not take with them any further. They flew to Bangkok, Thailand, and then to Singapore. There they were further delayed because the Russian ship carrying their wagon was delayed. They finally arrived in Perth, Australia in mid-November for an overall three-month delay. Dave said, we first have to find a replacement for Willie Make It. A mule arrived from Northern Australia and was presented to the Kunst Brothers by the Australian Tourist Commission. The cart finally arrived after another month. We look forward to nature at its rugged best with temperatures of 120 during the day and 40 at night. The main thing we are worried about are the flies. They are thick, always getting in your eyes, ears, mouth and nose. They finally resumed. They said the people of Australia had been very kind to them, supplying them with food and shelter and even clothing when they needed it along the way. At Seduna, Pete was suffering from leg and foot problems and decided to give up the walk and return home to California. Dave said, He has done all and more than I asked of him, and this will always be a Quince Brothers world walk. Dave would not be alone. A few months later, he very publicly told details how he had not been a faithful husband on his trek during these walking years. While waiting in Perth, Australia for a cart, he met a young school teacher, Jenny Samuel, 10 years his junior. They fell in love and lived together. She would continue as his crew. About a month later, the mule died from a heart attack. Dave expected to get a horse to pull the wagon the rest of the way to Sydney, but instead he had Jenny pull the cart with her car, which they named Will She Make It. Jenny drove three to four miles per hour while Dave walked alongside. Driving the car at a speed that Dave could walk burned out two clutches. It frustrated Jenny because walking so slow was boring. Dave insisted the car with the cart had to be alongside him or he would be just another guy walking. Dave arrived in Sydney, Australia where he prepared to fly to Los Angeles. I'm so close to the finish now. It's getting like I want to run. I've gained so much from these four years. I'll never take things like air conditioning and hot showers and toilet paper for granted again. He hated to leave Jenny behind and wished he could turn right around and walk back with her to Perth. But he knew he would come back for her. When Dave landed in Los Angeles, California, his wife Jan, children, and parents were at the airport to greet him, which didn't please him. He was very cold to his wife of 11 years, Jan. Now she was to me as much a stranger as anyone I might meet on the walk. What I wanted, I did tell her, was for us to be friends, just friends. He wanted his own life. His daughter could tell that he was never coming back to the family. While staying with his brother Pete in Santa Ana, he took Jan to a bar, told her that he wouldn't be coming back to her when he finished the walk. She cried hard with a broken heart. His focus was only on himself. Dave didn't want to take a mule with him the rest of the way from California to Minnesota, but his brother talked him into it, saying it would be good for his image. Dave's hometown chamber of commerce voted to send Dave money to buy another pack mule for the final 2,000 miles. On July 28, 1974, he started walking east again from Newport Beach, California. The mule only lasted two days and refused to move. Dave continued without the mule and only carried a small backpack initially with just one canteen. Without the mule and others around, Dave's pace dramatically picked up to about 35 miles per day across the extremely hot Mojave Desert. He carried very little water. Did he really walk all that stretch? The high temperatures were well above 100 degrees. Without a wise brother along, he seemed to no longer be walking for UNICEF, but for himself. The sign on his back was World Walk. 
Dave was seen walking up the narrow Virgin River Gorge in St. George, Utah. He chatted with police and other visitors. Near Cedar City, Dave said, I was walking along, minding my own business, when all of a sudden, two police cars pulled up either side of me with their lights on. Two men jumped out of the car, one with a gun, and shouted at me to put my hands above my head, and they were serious. I didn't know what was going on. It turned out that a gas station had just been robbed nearby, and a passing truck driver told authorities that Dave matched the description. This is the most exciting thing that happened to me since the shooting in Afghanistan. At Salina, Utah, he purchased a flashlight to help him watch out for snakes. He had given away his sleeping bag and other items because they became too heavy. Once he entered Colorado, the police forbid him to continue to walk on the interstate due to a state law that forbid pedestrian use. He was not happy about that because it would add many miles. The Colorado governor's office was sympathetic but didn't feel they could make an exception. Dave eventually chose to ignore the law and hoped he wouldn't be stopped again. He walked through the Eisenhower Tunnel east of Denver and was told that he was the first person allowed to do it on foot. Near Denver, walking in 90 degrees heat, he said, I'm anxious, really anxious now. I see the end in sight. I have about 1,000 miles to go. I don't think I'll ever do it again, although it has been a wonderful experience. A reporter witnessed him walking toward Lincoln, Nebraska. I found Kuntz striding down Interstate 180, his lanky frame eating up distance at a surprising rate. At Lincoln, he visited with the governor, was awarded a key to the city, and stayed in the Lincoln Hilton for free. As Dave approached closer to home, Jan Kunst was interviewed for a local story. She did her best to portray that they were a happy family, showed her continued support for Dave, and expressed that she had been fine with the walk. She said, quote, Every once in a while, older people will say something like, Isn't it just terrible that he just abandoned you like that? And I say, No, it's not. Most people who don't think the walk was a good idea don't mention it now when they talk to me. They know how I feel. But it had been hard on her. She said, It's not something I do, but I'm not him. We're different people, and we think differently. He needed to do it, so it was good for him to go ahead with it. The article stated, Friends and relatives say Jan has become more independent, more self-reliant since her husband left. Jan said, I know I can support the family now. I was kind of scared about getting a job and it took me about six months after Dave left before I found a job with the gas company. The job is great. I like being with people and it gets me out of the house. She said, Sometimes people ask me, What do you think about him being away from you so long? You know, what with all those women all over the world. And I really can't answer. It's something you try not to think about. She pretended that she expected him to return to the family. It won't be easy for any of us. We'll all have to readjust. We've all changed some and we'll have to find out how much and what to do about it. Things will be a little mixed up for a while, I think. Still in Nebraska, without his brother with him to talk some sense into him, Dave made the biggest public relations blunder of his entire walk. Perhaps he had read the article about his wife and it angered him. Dave did a detailed, controversial interview with Warren Wolf of the Minneapolis Tribune. Wolf published a long article in the newspaper. This article certainly torpedoed Dave's future opportunities for sponsorships, speaking engagements, and likely tens of thousands of dollars. Dave revealed his true colors just days before thousands of people planned to celebrate his finish. Clearly, he was tired of hiding behind the false, clean persona he had been putting forth for four years. I'm a social deviant, a radical, an oddball, even a little crazy. I don't fit into anybody's pattern and never will. I'm not ending the trip to become domesticated. I know that I'm not going to waste time doing things I don't like anymore, like trying to make a marriage work when there's nothing to work with. And let's face it, I'm not a priest. I've known a lot of women all over the world, and it didn't always end with a handshake. 
I'm not bragging. Sex is a natural part of life. Going without it for four and a half years would be unnatural. He went public on his feelings about his wife causing huge embarrassment to her and the rest of the family. She is a good mother, and she would make a great wife for a guy who likes to come home every day after work to a nice quiet meal and a nice quiet life. We haven't seen eye to eye on most things since long before the walk. I'm not going to be spending too much time at home. He had strong feelings about the countries that contained the people who had sacrificed and supported his walk with room and board and money. I've never seen so many ignorant people in my life. They are really stupid. Part of it is a lack of education, but part of it is cultural heritage. We take a lot of crap from a lot of crummy little countries. We're the most powerful nation on earth, and we ought to act like it. We don't need to give aid to countries that don't want to help us. He next trashed the people of his hometown of Wasika, who had been so proud of him and helped support him financially. There are some real good people in Wasika, but there are some awfully small people there. He railed on the men who would go down to the bars and complain about their lives. He said that they were gutless and should leave their wife and children just as he did. I really hate the guy who says he wouldn't go because his wife wouldn't let him. His greed showed as he stated that he was in the market to write a book and wanted $10,000 advance plus royalties. It's not going to be a travelogue. It'll be more about what I learned and thought as I traveled. I want to write about my attitudes, my parents, my family, people I know, all the things that have gone together to make me what I am now. He reflected on why he really did the walk. The true reason was to feed his ego, to be the first one to walk around the world. To take something that seems impossible and to go ahead and do it no matter what. If you can walk around the world, then you can do anything. When the article came out, Dave read it in Omaha, Nebraska, and was very pleased with it. He loved it, and wrote, Finally, someone had written down what I think about things. He knew it made him sound like a terrible person, but he liked that. He liked to shake people up. I stood there in the drugstore in the middle of Omaha, grinning like crazy, reading sections of the article over and over again by myself. There I was on page one as big as life. It sure made me feel good. His blunt and controversial statements about his wife, marriage, and foreigners shocked and angered many people in his hometown of Wasika, Minnesota. Plans started to shift away from an extravagant homecoming celebration. Influential leaders and companies quickly decided to boycott what was supposed to be a huge homecoming celebration. Dozens of protesting phone calls were received at the Chamber of Commerce in just two hours. Some people just could not believe that Dave said such things, and he was tracked down in Iowa. He doubled down on his word and was angry over the phone. After all his hometown had done with him, he foolishly trash-talked the town further. There have been towns I've walked through that have been better to me than Wasika. It is using the celebration for personal gain and not for my benefit. Jan's life now was in turmoil because of Dave's public rebuke. She said, quote, I never thought he would make a public issue out of our marriage. Everybody's up in arms in Wasika now. They've canceled a car he was going to have. Even if they go ahead with a homecoming, I doubt many people would be there. I'm not sure I would. It hurts what he said about other women, but I still love him. If he wants to try again, I'm willing. I just can't understand why he ruined everything so close to the end of it. The vice president of the Chamber of Commerce said, I'm just a little sick. Where do we go from here? We've got our tail in a crack now. The business people have voice shock and the residents anger. The kid did do something, but to take such a slap at his wife, the church and the community. Hal Greenwood, president of Midwest Federal Savings and Loan Association and president of UNICEF in Minneapolis, who had significantly helped finance Dave's trip, said, Dave is not the vision of the guy I first saw about five years ago. I was sincerely dedicated to him. I'm withdrawing my identification with him. That shocked Dave because Greenwood had been his biggest backer. To have him think that a few marks of mine made the whole walk meaningless makes me feel terrible. One resident said what many felt. 
I had misgivings about him leaving his wife and kids and going around the world in the first place. All this reconfirms my original thoughts. Well, how do you judge the sense of the people in the area here? Are there really very many people who were upset by some of his comments? Oh, I think the great many were. Yes, I do. Oh, yeah, there was quite a few people that were upset about the things he said, you know. And... It was said. To his angered hometowners, he started out with flag waving four years ago and is coming back thumbing his nose. The backlash was fierce and quick. An Associated Press article about the controversy went nationwide. Towns on its route home canceled welcomes. The Waseca Chamber of Commerce was convinced by their president, Uther Trudall, to take the high road. They voted to, quote, honor the completion of the walk, but not Dave Kunst's ideas. The mayor announced that he would refuse to participate in the homecoming celebration. Another town in Minnesota editorialized, He's handling his homecoming like a clod. Others supported him. I admire Kunst for both his walk and his candor. It is a man of rare quality to make the statements he did. He chose to be frank and honest. Another wrote, How many of us would even consider to walk around the world? Much less do it. David might not go to church, but as far as I'm concerned, he's quite a man. And, Hurrah for Dave Kunst. He has the guts to speak his mind and tell it like it is. Dave felt no remorse, and from the road in Iowa said the flap was unimportant. Dave entered Minnesota and was due to arrive in Waseca at 1.30 p.m. on October 6, 1974. His brother Pete came out to walk the last stretch along the road with him, along with the original mule, Willie Make It. Dave said, Two Kuntz brothers started this trip, and we said two Kunst brothers would finish it. A reporter, Greg Barron, covered Dave's finish. David Kunst was due to arrive at 1.30 Saturday afternoon. By 1 o'clock, clusters of townspeople were gathering expectantly on Waseca's main street. Above them, stretched across the boulevard, a banner proclaimed, Welcome home, Dave, and visitors arriving from nearby towns anxiously looked for places to park their cars in a town unaccustomed to providing a welcome for an international celebrity. Could you describe your feelings getting back into town now? Um, it's great, you know, I mean, geez, a lot of people out here. I feel like I'm one of the crowd, though, that's the thing, you know, I mean, really. Is there any one single influence or desire that kept you going? Well, you know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of things. That this you, Somebody wouldn't do this walk, and I don't think they could do this walk unless they liked it. I mean, I'm a little crazy. No, I said that before. But uh, it's a combination of a lot of great ideas. The idea to walk around the world. Nobody has ever done that before in this day and age. I mean, you know, it, it amazed me. I thought it was fantastic then. I think it's fantastic now. All right, we've reached the, uh, the edge of town now, walking through uh, an area of Highway 14, lined by two-story frame houses. There goes the church bell. We're walking by one of the largest churches in town. People are standing in doorways, looking out, some simply looking curious and watching carefully, others smiling and waving at David Kuntz. With American flags waving and the high school band playing the national anthem, onlookers were virtually everywhere, filling the street, standing on roofs, and peering out second-story windows. Yes, he was at home at last, and it looked as if the whole town had turned out to welcome him. For David Kuntz, the journey ended as it had begun, with a single step and a dream that could not be denied. Finally, the crowd came to rest in front of the Waseca Cinema, and the speech-making began. Uther Trodal, president of the Chamber of Commerce, summed it all up. Dave, on behalf of your hometown and its Chamber of Commerce, I welcome you home and congratulate you on completing your walk around the world. Waseca now has the distinction of being the hometown of the first and only man who walked around the world, and we're darn proud of you, Dave, and darn proud of our town, Waseca. Thank you. Now, he says, he'll write a book and perhaps conduct a speaking tour. But whatever he does, it's not likely that he'll return to a domestic sort of life. As he put it to me, he said, Listen, if I thought I had to go back to the old pace, I'd walk right out of town again. This is Greg Barron. It was later reported, 
Dave Kuntz strode into his hometown Saturday afternoon in tumultuous welcome from an estimated 5,000 people who swarmed around him seeking autographs or just a touch from the only man who has walked around the world. Dave told well-wishers that his walk was for himself and that walking for UNICEF was secondarily. Local UNICEF officials said that so far they had only collected $4,000. At a press conference, Dave said, there are good and little people in Wasika, just as every other town, but right now it looks to me like there's a lot of big people in Wasika. He talked for about 45 minutes and received applause and laughter. He did say some kind things about his wife, Jan. She's done a great job. I don't think I understand her. I'm sure she doesn't understand me. He said her domestication and his liberal ways caused mutual resentment. Four hours later, he slipped out of town to his parents' home in Cedar Lake, Iowa for several weeks. I never intended to stay here in Wasika. The article gave me a whole lot of freedom because now I don't have to Mickey Mouse around about where my wife and I are. Everyone knows where I stand and where we stand. The following week, Dave visited a Minneapolis lawyer consulting about business angles to capitalize on the walk. His main focus was to start writing his book. He made some radio and television appearances and claimed to have several network shows to be in the works. He said he rejected about 50 requests to speak in schools, clubs, or church groups. He still had no intentions to return home to Wasika and his family. He estimated that he had only spent $2,500 of his own money over the four and a half years. Without help, he estimated that it would have cost him about $25,000. That's likely a gross underestimate. A month later, his children received letters from him reminding them that, quote, we're free to go where we wish and to be what we are. He said that people who make their own rules get special pleasure out of doing something well, even if it's only for themselves. Dave went to Australia for a year to be with Jenny and brought her back with him. He vowed that he would never again get a 9 to 5 job. Jenny likely provided support. A year after his walk in 1975, he said he had nearly finished his book. I found it wasn't so easy to write a book as I anticipated. He had not seen his kids for a year and hoped to return to visit Minnesota. He also planned to put together a color slide presentation and tour the country. With some contacts, Dave successfully got his walk included in Guinness Book of World Records as being the first to walk around the world. In later years, it was discovered that George M. Schilling was likely the first. Dave's entry was later changed to be the first, quote, verified walk around the world. But that was absolutely false, because there was no independent verification along the way making sure he walked every step. There are many sections along the way where it could have been cheated, but I choose to believe he really accomplished the walk. But his walk was no more independently verified than the others that I covered in previous episodes, and he was not the first. In 1976, Dave finally divorced Jan. He still railed publicly against marriage, but the next month, out of the public spotlight, he married Jenny in a simple private ceremony. In 1977, a reporter found Dave working a newspaper route in Costa Mesa, California, delivering 400 newspapers and living with Jenny. His dream of getting a lot of cash to write his book did not come together like he hoped. He had written a massive 500,000 word book, but the writing was forced and stilted. He sent the manuscript to Doubleday, but they were not interested. He also was rejected by Reader's Digest. He was frustrated with his inability to cash in on his adventure and still could not understand that he had killed those opportunities himself. He hoped for a TV movie with Clint Eastwood playing his role. <laughs> that didn't get any traction. He finally was trying to find a better way to support himself and was taking real estate and business courses at a junior college. At age 38, he said, I haven't grown up yet, and I like that. My personal opinion is that most people in the world are gutless. He again railed against organized life, religion, and marriage. He still was very down on Wasika, Minnesota, and the criticism that he had received for leaving his family to go on the walk. Those people are living their lives, and I'm living my life, 
and it really doesn't matter. In 1978, Dave found a writer in New York who started helping him rewrite his book down to 50,000 words. He was pleased with the progress and hoped to make a million dollars on the book and become famous. Finally, in July 1979, Dave's book was published as The Man Who Walked Around the World, A True Story. The reviews were poor. While interesting, the timeline and flashbacks are very hard to follow and confusing, especially to those who had never heard of his walk before. The book told a tale of an egocentric man enjoying himself greatly on his trip. He boasted and told of his exploits with many women and proudly wrote about his lack of kindness toward his wife who was taking care of his children back home. Toward the end, he reprinted the entire famed article published near the end of his walk. He was still very proud of every word and had no regrets. A reviewer in Minnesota wrote, After just 33 pages, I have given up. Life is simply too short to waste any more time on such nonsense. No, David did not make his million dollars on the book, but he was able to go on a book tour and get on radio shows. At age 45 in 1985, Dave kept his story alive by spending most of his time telling his story and giving slide presentations to school children, college students, and other groups, mostly in Southern California, with the message of, you can do it. He started to call himself Earthwalker. You know, everybody has dreams, but you might say I took action on my dream, because I wanted to do something. Well, that's another thing, too. With When he came back, he did slide presentations to schools all throughout Orange County, Northern California, Southern California. And the things that I loved him saying to kids is that, set your goal, believe in who you are, you can do it. I walked around the world. I can do that. I did that. Follow your heart. Do your dreams. In 1994, Dave returned to Wasika to celebrate the 20th anniversary of his walk, but said, Not too many townspeople showed up. In 2002, the Minnesota History Center in St. Paul put together an exhibit to honor his walk. It included the Turkish wagon he had used on the journey. In 2004, the Kuntz brothers' birthplace and childhood home, Caledonia, put up a wonderful sign recognizing their feet. Both Dave and Pete came out for the unveiling. In 2020, Dave Kunst, age 80, and Jenny, age 70, were still living in Newport Beach, California. Pete was 75 and living in College Station, Texas. Jan Kunst was 81 and still living in Wasika, Minnesota. Dave Kunst followed a dream. After closely examining his walk, I feel confident that he really did it. He achieved an enormous goal and endurance accomplishment. He demonstrated in the modern era that it was possible to walk around the world. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, And most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances.